I've got an interest in hip arthroscopy, but I don't have any commercial relationships. Um, David asked me to talk about success and failure on evolving indications for surgery. And one of the big successes in, shown in, worldwide in hip arthroscopy is the number of hip arthroscopies being done. And, and it's, it's growing in Australia quite dramatically. And this is reflected around the world as well. So uh, currently, this is current data, financial year data from MBS, and you can see the, there are around nearly 3,000 for the last financial year ending 2011, 2010, 2011, uh, compared to say 8,000 uh, shoulder scopes with uh, uh, 48960, I think that says, um, tough, uh, a cuff repair type arthroscopy of the shoulder. And the same with the knee, there are a lot more knee um, surgeries done clearly. Uh, and this has been reflected around the world, no doubt, and it's growing at about 15% per year. Now, techniques since I started, I started with John back in uh, 2007. I spent six months with him, and by the end of that six months, I'd seen probably 300 or thereabouts arthroscopies, I think. And um, compared to what I did then, to compared to what I do now, it's changed and it's growing and it's becoming more complex and um, instead of doing back in 07 we did uh, maybe four or five um, label repairs a month now I'd do four or five so 50 percent or thereabouts would be a label repair of some description and those advancements have come through access and being able to move around the hip adequately and the instrument techniques, uh, instrument uh, uh, options for us have become much greater. But um, in the central and peripheral, peripheral and the anterior compartments we can get into and we can do things in them um, uh, with, uh, with good effect. Now there's been a really big increase in the number of uh, published uh, literature, literature uh, uh, reports and it, that's really broadened our knowledge base substantially. And I'll just um, have a look at this one. This is uh, published late last year. It's Joe Camp, and Joe's a, a good friend of mine, and some other local uh, Melburnians, Michael MacDesey, uh, and so on. Now, they did, there's enough uh, pub, uh, published literature there to be able to do a, system, a systemic review, um, or systematic review, sorry. And they showed, really, that out to 10 years, hip arthroscopy has substantial benefits to patients with intra-articular pathology, reducing their pain, improving their function. So there's no doubt that hip arthroscopy is, is here and it works and it's got long-term um, uh, improvements in patient function. Osteoplasty though, and one of the, one of the, we're still in a work in progress with our femoral osteochondroplasties. Uh, we've only got information really out to three years at this point and uh, the next, the next 10 years will show whether, whether the osteoplasty is actually changing the, the natural history of uh, our, our patient's hips. Um, I think hip arthroscopy is, is well and truly a gold standard in diagnosis in groin pain and hip pain. And the, it's not possible to do a complete evaluation of a chondrolabral junction and ligamentum teres in a hip by imaging alone. Um, and MRI really sadly um, falls behind in, in our diagnostic ability to rule out pathology in the hip uh, uh, without an arthroscopy. So the less common, if I do the less common indications first perhaps, um, loose bodies and uh, infection, metallosis for hip replacement. I unfortunately live in Hobart, there are a lot of ASR um, uh, hip replacements done there and uh, they were total replacements with large metal and metal bearings and in the early phases before we really knew what was wrong with them I scoped quite a number of them to get biopsies and to take samples and try and grow bugs and work out what to do with them. We don't do that anymore. Um, synovitis, uh, gluteal tears in the, in the peripheral compartment, in the, in the lateral compartments. Um, bursitis and sinus pathology too I see a bit of and, and, and treat. Now the indication is really pain, unresponsive to non-operative management is, is, uh, is, is a good indication for, for an arthroscopy, but usually it's trauma related and it's in a younger population is how I see it. Now patients can have a relatively normal range of motion, have a one incident 
of trauma to their hip where they take the hip out of the normal range of motion it has and it damages the hip. And that damage causes them pain. We can treat that, we can debride it, we can repair the labrum, we can trim away uh, parts of the ligamentum teres and they get better and you don't need to do anything to change the patient's morphology, bony morphology, or, or to increase their range of motion of the hip. More chronically, if they're impinging uh, in a minor fashion, uh, sitting down here, getting in and out of your car, that type of thing, some occasional groin tightness, and they've developed on a road to an arthritic hip, uh, then they can break off sections of cartilage and they can become loose bodies and, you, and, and a simple trim up there too will sort out their discomfort. Um, the labral tears and chondrolabral junction tears, and, and most tears that we see on an MRI really are chondrolabral junction tears and usually it's the, it's the cartilage pulling away from the labrum that's the torn piece, not the labrum torn off the bone, if that makes sense. And so those, um, those injuries in a, can be acute or chronic and it depends on what the patient's range of motion is to what you need to do with it. So a real success in, in what hip arthroscopy has brought to the knowledge base of, of hip anatomy is the morphological descriptions uh, or the anatomy of the hip during motion has really helped their understanding. But, and this is, this is a personal opinion, are we becoming a bit carried away with the radiological based assessments of femoral head neck morphology and acetabular morphology and what's normal and what's not? And by that I mean 20% um, of the population is going to have a reduced range of motion of the hip and 20% of the population is going to have some type of morphological abnormality that could lead to impingement. But not 20% do have problems from that. So to put up an x-ray, and I see it all the time and I'm sure you all see it and it becomes quite frustrating for you, uh, an x-ray report comes up, this person's got a cam deformity uh, and it can be an x-ray of a pelvis for, for trauma for some other reason, but it, it, it is a continuing um, uh, over, over uh, assessment of, of, of what the patient's problem is. And I think to, to break hip pathology down from an arthroscopic point of view, the fundamental principle of femoroacetabular impingement is that every hip has a range of motion and that range of motion is the most important thing you need to consider. And if the hip gets moved out of its normal range of motion that it has, and everyone's different, then it'll get damaged. And it'll get damaged as it levers, as it uh, uh, jams on the rim, and that will cause their pain. It's not the shape of the hip that causes pain, it's what the shape does to the, to the edge of the hip that causes pain. So we definitely know that hips with morphological abnormalities uh, are known to reduce their range of motion and they have a greater chance of developing arthritis. <clears throat> now this is a really nice paper by uh, Tom Pollard and, and his authors. Uh, it was published just late last year in Arthritis and Rheumatism and um, they looked at, uh, uh, took a group of people, 1,000 women, and they took out um, those, they were only women of course because it was a study, but over 20 years they, they took out um, those who went to total hip and they took out a random sample of 240 or thereabouts um, patients and they looked at all the different parameters that would uh, lead to them look, uh, uh, developing arthritis and they, they looked at their x-rays from, from the two year mark and what they found was that the, the measures that would lead to a cam, being described as a cam deformity, have a, have a very significant um, uh, ongoing risk for arthritis. So that is, if you've got a cam deformity, um, you are at greater risk of then going on to develop arthritis. And they, they've shown that really nicely there. Now, one of the failures of the hip in general is it's a very, very tolerant joint. Um, and certainly in my practice, I'm always astounded of the number of people who can walk in in their mid-50s and they say, Doc, you know, my hip started to hurt uh, three months ago and it's just got worse and worse and worse and you do an x-ray and they've got bone-on-bone -bone arthritis and you think, this has been going on for 30 years. It's not just happened in the last three months, but it hasn't hurt you before then. So the hip is a very tolerant joint and it can take an enormous amount of punishment without hurting. And our problem 
to be able to change the natural history of where a hip's going to go after it's injured is to get them early enough in their, in their injury and stop that jamming occurring in their daily life to try and change their course in, in natural history. So this chap is a pretty typical guy. He's, um, he's only 28 and he plays a bit of football and uh, you can pick lots of abnormalities in his, in his femur. Okay? This, uh, you can see his version's not great, his, uh, his uh, antiversion's not great in his femurs. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of uh, antiversion in his acetabulum either. Um, he, he's got cam deformities, he's got cysts, the whole bit. Now, this, is, this one actually doesn't hurt too bad, but he's got cysts in his acetabulum as well. Now, if I show you um, his next picture, so this is inside his joint. You can see the labrum at the top, and this is his articular cartilage superiorly. And so his full thickness loss, greater than 50% through the superior dome of his acetabulum. He's only, hurt for, he's only been hurting playing football. He's running around on it. It hasn't been that bad. His labrums are relatively well attached. He's got a, some ligamentum teres uh, degeneration and tearing. His uh, femoral cartilage is reasonably good. He's got numerous loose fragments of cartilage within the joint itself floating around. And the problem that hip, one of the failures of hip arthroscopy, if you like, is we don't know what to do or we, we, we have trouble fixing that to, to make a normal hip again. So what we can do is trim the loose, um, loose cartilage away. Um, if the flap was in better condition, we might, we might uh, do a, a, some tissue glue and, and microfracturing behind it to try and get it to stay there, a bit like a Macy graft. Um, uh, Macy grafts are not available anymore. We, we were using those on rare occasions. But um, basically our line of treatment for that is um, debride it, microfracture it, and change patients' um, uh, expectations. To, so if I go to the next slide here, here's another, here's another guy. Now here's a, here's a, um, a guy who's had a one incident, as a footballer, he's had one incident, this is eight days after his accident, um, tall guy, he's a ruckman, and he jammed his hip landing awkwardly, uh, he couldn't really walk that well afterwards. He certainly couldn't run. And um, the club were concerned about him. We did a scope and this is what we found. He's got a cam deformity. He'd never had hip bone before and had, uh, just starting his professional career. Now he has lost a very significant part of his superior acetabulum. comes right down here. It pockets out just down the bottom. And we'll see that in a moment. That's a very, very large injury and... The biggest problem we've got with impingement and that sort of cam deformity is you often get full thickness loss like this and to be able to fix it you need to get and get to the hip, change the mechanics prior to having these massive chondral injuries. Um, and to, to say to a young fellow like this, um, am I going to play again doc and what's, what's going to happen? It's very difficult for, to give, to give a, a reasonable answer what's going to happen to him. I think I know what's going to happen to him. He's going to get arthritis and not be able to do what he wants to do. Um, so in essence, hip arthroscopy is very successful in being able to get into a joint. We can change uh, cam lesions. We can, we can reshape the femoral head and neck junction. We can trim away acetabular overhang, we can do label repairs, we can do all this type of thing, but our biggest failure is not a failure in the arthroscopy itself, it's a failure in the ability to repair cartilage. And that, if we can sort that out, then, uh, then hip arthroscopy will certainly be a whole lot easier um, uh, to, to, to gain really good results. I'll click that on. So when chondral damage is uh, present, uh, the questions we don't really know is what happens uh, to, the, to the hip in the longer term when cartilage is damaged and to what extent can you get away with uh, changing the biomechanics of the hip by taking cams off, by trimming away uh, rim lesions, by repairing labrum, giving people more range of motion so they don't jam the hip on a daily basis and will that change the natural history of the hip or not? We, we don't really know. It certainly does help their symptoms but we don't know what's going to happen to the chondral surfaces down the track. Yeah.